Ontario Clean Cities Coalition, the East Bay Clean Cities Coalition, and the Long Beach Clean Cities Coalition, we, we'd like to thank you for joining us for this Tech and Spec webinar on, on uh, propane near zero emission drivetrains for trucks and buses. Um, as Edgar just said, uh, we will be recording this uh, event and it will be posted to the Clean Cities website, which is cleancitiesacramento.org. And uh, we'd like to, as a part of this, thank all of the sponsors that make it possible for our Clean Cities Coalition to be able to be here and to function. And uh, also to note, we've had a number of, of our Tech and Spec webinars uh, that have uh, been presented before. We're doing the Renewable Propane Tech and Spec webinar today. And uh, on November 11th, we'll be doing a successful grant writing and finding grant opportunities uh, webinar. And on December the 9th, we're gonna be doing a, another heavy duty battery electric drivetrain uh, webinar. And th with that, I would like to um, announce or introduce, excuse me, our speakers today, Steve Whaley, who's the Director of Auto Gas Business Development with the Propane Education and Research Council, and Ryan Zick, who's the Vice President of Sales with Roush. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, uh, Stephen, to get going. Well, I appreciate that, Tim. Thank you. I want to thank you, Tim, for uh, allowing us to be here today. I have asked Ryan also, as I'm going through my slides, to jump in and make some comments along the way of some of the things I might be leaving out that are germane to, to what's there. But before we get started, I think Edgar had two polling questions that we were going to try and do so that we can get a feel for who is participating in the audience here. So if you would look at question number one, uh, which, which of the following best describes you? I am and Pick, pick, your, uh, pick your spot there with uh, a fleet representative, a policymaker, or a policy influencer, a propane industry member, or if you want to be somebody else today, you can hit the other. Um, if you would go ahead and click those for us now and then go on uh, down to the second question. Uh, and that would be, if you answered fleet representative to the question above, um, what kind of fleet representative are you doing? Is, is it people transportation uh, for school or people transportation for non-school like a paratransit? Uh, are you in a commercial delivery uh, realm of things or in a municipal realm? Um, let us know uh, what that is so that we can take a peek at those results and just make sure we target our uh, presentations accordingly. <laughs> Just give you a second to do that. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we're going to see some of the results here. Oh, that other group is a big one. I like that. <clears throat> okay, so that means we're going to just encompass everything. All right. And then we're looking uh, for transportation. We have non school, we have municipal service at 30%. And uh, okay, very good. That's super helpful. Uh, thank you for, for, for doing that and getting us going. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> before we talk about renewable propane, we, we have to talk about uh, propane. We, we have two sources for, for, for propane. We have an organic source or a conventional source, uh, which most of what our propane comes from today that you're seeing everywhere is a, a, a byproduct of the natural gas processing, uh, about 70% of that. But we also have renewable propane uh, and both sources have the same attributes. Um, the molecular structure is the same. Uh, we have the same benefits, it's non-toxic. You know, you can't spill this stuff. Uh, you're never gonna have a tank, you know, leakage into a soil or water source. Uh, all of those benefits are there. Um, so <clears throat> as we go through, everybody knows the success that we've had nationally with school buses, 20,000 of them being implemented. And that was just a count at the earlier part of this year. And we're, we're in over a thousand school districts from uh, across the country. And we're moving about 1.25 million kids to and from school when all the schools are open and all the kids are uh, you know, on, on their normal schedules. But what are the growth markets that we see that are going to catch up with that school bus type of success? And the criteria for, for that success is just what we were you know, mentioning today. This is that medium duty environment, that class three through seven that all of you signed up to, to hear about. 
And it's, uh, it's also more in a high volume fuel consumption. Um, the more fuel you actually use, uh, the more money that you save because every gallon of propane is way cheaper than the gallon of gasoline and diesel. Uh, so the more that you use, the more you're gonna save and the more you use, the more you're gonna displace from environmental uh, emissions from gasoline and diesel as well. And we like going after the, the longer range, not just the local, you know, urban, but we can do the longer regional routes uh, because we can, can, we can contain enough fuel on board the vehicle without changing its weight uh, to go three, 400 miles uh, or more. <clears throat> so with that, let's take a peek at what's going on in food and beverage. I think everybody's familiar with Schwann's. Um, Ryan, how, how many Schwann's vehicles do we have on propane now? Uh, isn't it close to about 4,000 that we that we have running on propane now? Yeah, and those are deployed. I'll, uh, I'll show a map later on to give people a better idea where some of these vehicles are, but those are deployed all over the United States, really coast to coast. Terrific. Um, yeah. And I, and I know... I know we started with Nestle about five years ago, but how many how many Nestle waters delivery trucks do we have have running on propane now? You know what? In in food and beverage as a total, we have almost one thousand unique end users to give you an idea of how widespread it is beyond Nestle. But Nestle obviously is one of our highest volume individual customers with with probably over the last eighteen months three hundred vehicles or so added. Tremendous adoption from a major uh, nationwide company. Terrific, terrific. The other group is the paratransit group. And what I mean by paratransit, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about those shuttle buses and high capacity vans uh, that is a real sweet spot for, for propane adoption. Uh, we have about 6,000 of those operating across the United States now. So we have a very high percentage of that market and they're operating on 600 gallons per month per vehicle on average. And every county has these, and the, you know, the American with Disabilities Act requires that, and the FDA actually pays for 80% uh, of those vehicles, but they'll pay 85% of those new vehicle costs if it's running on propane. So <clears throat> with that, the uh, paratransit is a great market to go into. And everybody's familiar with the parcel package delivery, especially with UPS uh, and with FedEx and all of their propane vehicles. But one that's really catching on is the United States Postal Service independent contractors. Uh, not many people know, but of the 92,000 routes uh, Postal Service has, 70,000 of those routes are done by independent contractors who own their own trucks, buy their own fuel, and make those deliveries, not to your home, but in between the distribution centers and hubs for the Postal Service. So these are in every zip code in the land. And we are doing uh, a tremendous effort with them on their straight box trucks. There's about 10,000 of those. Uh, we just did eight in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Uh, a, new, a new one's going in the Denver metro area with another five being deployed there. And these vehicles are running day and night, six and a half days a week, and using over a thousand gallons of fuel every month in every vehicle. So you can see why that one would be a real high target because of the cost savings as well as the emission reductions. One of the beauties of uh, doing auto gas as an alternative, it has the least cost of any infrastructure. And I'm talking about gasoline or diesel. That infrastructure, we have a lot of varieties of things. City of Boston has 400 school buses there that operate on propane, but even when they were operating on diesel, they still didn't have a diesel pump because they couldn't fit it in the yard. They didn't have any room whatsoever. These things are stacked on top of each other. So we did exactly what the diesel trucks were doing. We came in with a bobtail and it has two reels and actually two of these trucks go in every single night and fill up every single one of those vehicles every day. That's not the most common, uh, but we can also do temporary refueling. If for some reason you have a fleet that's moved and has to go someplace, uh, there is temporary fueling with its own standby generator that operates on propane as well. And these truly can go anywhere, especially in uh, emergency response uh, times, they can go anywhere. <clears throat> but most folks are, are doing their own private station. Uh, even though there's 3,500 public refueling sites on the DOE's alt fuel locator, 
there's even more sites that are behind the gate at a particular fleet because it's so inexpensive to do. You don't need to have a, uh, a multiple shared site to get what you need right at your facility. And the most common one here is, is like this uh, particular system it has a, a, a 1000 with a dispenser and we can do this very inexpensively. Um, you can see how scalable it is. If you're increasing the number of vehicles, you can just add another tank. You don't have to do anything with a dispenser. It doesn't take any more electricity to operate it. It's a closed dryer outlet, a 220, 30 amp circuit. Uh, and you can stack these things side by side and space them apart to be able to get a couple of long vehicles in front of them. And if you're really getting in there with you know, hundreds of vehicles, you can get an 18 or even a 30,000 gallon tank and use the same mix dispensers that you started with when you had a 1000 tank, extremely scalable and, and getting up. So, and it's customizable too. If you have a really small footprint and you need to go up instead of out, uh, vertical tanks are an option, as well as an 18 that takes up about the size of one bus parking space, as you can see here. The dispensers, you can get something that just meters out, you know, one gallon at a time. Uh, and you can write it down in your notebook in that top left. Uh, but then you can also get every kind of fuel management system known to mankind integrated into the same dispenser for moving propane through there at 13 gallons a minute, just like with gasoline and diesel. So there's no time uh, uh, compromise on, on refueling as well. Even going down to uh, what, uh, what's at the uh, convenience store here in Minnesota on the Michigan to Montana uh, alt fuel corridor, this one's at the bottom of the exit ramp for, for Interstate 94. And this is a full card reader, slide it in, go pump it. And because it has the uh, quick connect nozzle, uh, which is required now from January 1 of 2020, uh, you click it on, click it off. You can't spill it. No gloves, no eyewear. Uh, none of that is needed, just like the picture shows here. Oh, here's the, the, the picture of the nozzle here where you can just click it on. All right, so just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, I've, I've done propane. I actually did CNG for, for quite a few years as well. Uh, but if you're using existing diesel, you're not gonna have any infrastructure costs. It's just, you know, right there. But if you add in, you can spend $40,000 in equipment if you want the full card reader, the integrated you know, fuel management systems and all of that. You could spend $40,000 in equipment. Uh, but you're going to spend a minimum of a couple hundred thousand dollars just to do 10 fixed time fill hoses or to get an electric fast charge on there for 10 vehicles. But that's not really scalable. You'll have to get more power or more compressors to add on to that. But with that 40,000, you can just change out a tank and do more vehicles. All right, so what's our path to zero? That's what we're really aiming for here. Propane started with its uh, uh, non-particulate matter. It's virtually zero, and with renewable, it is. Um, we started there, but we moved rapidly into reducing NOx, which is the largest you know, harmful contributor to respiratory illnesses. And even though we can meet the certified 0.02 ultra-low NOx, University of West Virginia did a study and what they did was they took the best in class clean diesel versus the best in class clean propane and they put mobile emission testing on them, ran them for a few months. And even though they both met the EPA and CARB standards, the propane was 96% less NOx than that clean diesel. Now we're moving into the greenhouse gas emissions as well as total life cycle of which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And we're getting better with that as well. well our future is in the renewable auto gas. Worldwide by 2040, all of the suppliers are saying that we're going to be half of all of our propane is going to be renewable by the year 2040. So where's it coming from now? The largest one in the United States is REG. Uh, they are producing renewable diesel and uh, as a byproduct of that production, we get renewable propane also. Uh, we're going to talk here in just a minute about uh, the, the REG propane that's, that's coming out of Camp's propane right there in Sacramento. But another source for renewable propane is actually taking 80% of our regular conventional propane and adding in 20% of what's called renewable DME. Uh, right there in California, Oberon's headquarters down in Southern California is doing that. And their projections for 2021 is 1.6 million gallons of renewable DME made from uh, most of it coming from dairy farm. And with that, we are able to achieve a carbon index of a single digit, uh, which is significant when we want to talk about the others. So we'll be able to get about 8 million gallons of, of, uh, of 
renewable propane with that blending. Uh, but right there in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, you have Phillips 66, which just announced a couple of weeks ago, their uh, retrofitting of a facility there that's going to give us about 35 million gallons of renewable propane each year. So that's where it's coming from. But let's take a peek. You know, we, we've, we've been hearing a lot about EV vehicles, uh, passenger vehicles, mid-duty vehicles, heavy-duty vehicles. So let's do a comparison since that's the baseline today. Let's do a, a greenhouse gas life cycle analysis comparison between a mid-duty propane vehicle, much like that, uh, that box truck I was showing you from, uh, from one of the postal contractors, a class seven, uh, class six or class seven comparison of a propane one and a medium duty EV truck. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. Um, the boundaries of that life cycle analysis is, is located here. You can look at this on the recording a little bit later if you want to. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details, but we're doing the heavy part of this, the vehicle usage and the following the fuel from its production all the way into its use on that vehicle. The recycling of everything afterwards, there's not enough data to really compare it and it's negligible between the two. So we're only measuring that uh, main part of the solid blue here. So what does it look like for the electric grid across these United States? Um, you can see where the fossil fuels, uh, coal, natural gas, uh, some petroleum, and, and by the way, not all fossil fuels are created equal. Um, wood and oil and coal are, are very dirty fossil fuels, but natural gas and propane are extremely clean fossil fuels. So to lump them all together into one isn't a very accurate way of doing measurements. So this is the percentage of uh, uh, energy sources that are going in from the fossil fuel arena. But if we go to the electric grid sources for renewable, you can see where nuclear is very popular. You can see where hydro in the Pacific Northwest is very popular. You can see where solar is starting to catch on and where wind is, is, is picking in uh, that a little bit, not much on the geothermal, a little bit. So if you were to take a whole well to wheels carbon intensity comparison, we have uh, all of the pad regions here on the left for conventional propane, for organic propane. This is not renewable yet. This is just our good old regular propane. And we range in a carbon intensity there from 79 to about 83, depending on where you are in the country. Compared to the right side, you see the electric grids carbon intensity in each of those states. Okay, And you can see where the coal producers are you know, getting, getting pretty high in their electric grid. So let's look at five different case studies. The first one is actually going to be regular propane compared to the electric grid. In 38 states, and I know we're focusing on California here, but just bear with me for a second. But in 38 states, we're already this many tons of CO2 less than the same EV medium duty truck. And what I mean by that is that medium duty truck traveling 200 miles a day, every day for a year, and say in the state of Texas there, it's 169 tons of CO2 on a one truck to one truck Delta comparison. That's how much difference it's going to be in tons of CO2, okay? So that's just regular propane. Let's go to renewable propane. This is the same propane that Camps has there right in Sacramento. I believe it's in the Florin district of South Sacramento on 7459 Reese Road. Um, this is a 24 hour uh, card lock. So if you set up an account there, you can actually go in anytime you want and get 100% renewable propane. So let's look at California for this one. So if you go over to camps and you get some of their 100% renewable propane and you compare that to an EV truck in the same medium duty class, you're actually going to be 131 tons of CO2 less greenhouse gases than you are gonna be with that EV vehicle from the EV grid that's in California today, okay? Now, if you take the renewable propane, uh, I'm sorry, if you take propane and the renewable DME blend that, that we were talking about, it's a little bit better, it's 185. So let's do the best of the best, okay? We're gonna take our renewable propane and we're gonna blend it with renewable DME. And now we get some serious numbers in reductions of CO2 on that one vehicle to one vehicle comparison. Well, Steve, that's not fair because the electric grid is getting cleaner too. 
All right, so by 2035, if everybody meets their goals of the electric grid getting cleaned up, and what we're gonna do by, uh, by saying that is we're gonna say all of the electric grids in every state are gonna achieve 95% of their grid renewable, okay? And then we're also gonna go from a 1000 cycle battery in that medium duty vehicle to a 5000 cycle battery, the million mile battery, the one that doesn't ever need to be changed out. And we're gonna compare now our best case of renewable propane compared to the best case of the electric grid. And we're still this many tons cleaner than the electric grid in 2035. Okay, so just to recap here, the benefits of propane and renewable propane is, you know, the, the same fuel uh, that we're dispensing now in your propane buses and your propane paratransits and trucks, we can drop in renewable propane without changing a thing. In other words, it's the same engines that are certified now are gonna operate the exact same way because the molecular structure is exactly the same way. And so we're all, we're gonna do that at an average cost of a propane vehicle over, over, over diesel is about 15%. Some of it's less and, and, and some of it's more, but the average is about 15% incremental cost to operate on propane, okay, which is, far less than most of the other alternatives. Uh, but then also with the payload, you're not adding any weight. Uh, the, the propane system in tanks is, is basically the same weight as a, as a gasoline or a diesel. So you don't have to compromise on giving up any of your payload space. And just like we've uh, shown here in the, in the previous slides, the CO2 greenhouse gas emissions are extremely less. Uh, we've got, it's a low carbon intensity, it's a very inexpensive feedstock, we have a lot of it. And the important part is, is we don't take much energy at all to convert to using renewable propane. It's a byproduct of those refineries as well. I know you're going to want to check uh, some fact checks on all the references that I have here of where we got our data. So I'm listing it here so that you can have it. And I want to thank you. And we're going to let Ryan go ahead and take over the slides here and go ahead with the engine portion of this. Thanks, Steve. Great job. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm Ryan Zick with Roush Cleantech. I'm the Vice President of Sales, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to go a little bit further into detail on specific applications. Uh, Steve did a great job of giving us a lot of background of the industry, where we're headed with renewables. So we'll talk a little bit more about specific applications that we have today and also what Roush Cleantech's doing um, in the near zero propane landscape. So Without further ado, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Roush Cleantech and where we've come from. So we're about 12 years old as a subsidiary of the larger company that is Roush, which is really an engineering services firm. And we've gained a lot of experience from that parent company that does a lot of automotive and tier one manufacturing and uh, engineering. It's led us through a lot of different projects in the alternative fuel space. And not just recently, going back over several decades, um, all, all electric projects that take us back over 20 years, uh, hydrogen fuel cell projects, uh, propane as, as we're well known for at Cleantech, compressed natural gas, many of the other alternative fuels that some have come and gone and uh, some are here and staying and emerging that we've been very closely aligned with. And we've chosen to pursue propane, and we have been doing that at Cleantech here for the past decade, um, pretty heavily in the medium duty space because we find it to be such an excellent fit for that class three through seven space. And we're going to talk about why we believe that to be the case. So just to elaborate a little bit more about our competencies as a company. So basically from everything that you uh, can think of from that whole product ideation, from everything from... Uh, the original concept, the business case for what we're going after through to design, styling, testing, um, very heavily uh, in the design and automotive, as well as the powertrain development and validation. Roush has a very strong partnership with um, for, through many of the automotive uh, companies, whether we're talking about domestic or we're talking about import, and obviously a very close alignment with Ford Motor Company, which really takes us to our portfolio in the class three through seven space and medium duty. So our experience uh, in the alternative fuel world and with propane, uh, today Steve started getting into a little bit of the, uh, the accounts that we have experience with, but over 24,500 vehicles on the road being powered by liquid propane injection. We've accumulated a little over a billion miles now um, and over 1,300 major customers across the U.S. and Canada. So really a lot of growth and you can see our lineup there to some degree at the bottom of the page and you can see from that commercial application all the way to the school bus application. 
So uh, first we'll start looking at the uh, school bus applications. It's been very successful. We have had a partnership with Bluebird that goes back to 2012. Um, and it's really bared a lot of fruit for us um, and the, our dealer network out there across the country. So you can see here over 15,000 school bus deployments, a lot of different areas. And really what this shows is the resiliency of the fuel itself to be able to work in applications from high heat, high altitude, extreme cold, and really everywhere in between. And we've really had positive experiences with the fuel. It's also helped us, all this experience has helped us come up with new generations of the uh, product to get better every time. And we're actually just about to launch and in the launch process of our generation five technology. So it's already gone through five generations of change since we've launched the product. Moving on from school bus to our non-school bus deployments. This really has been an equal part and equal success to school bus just across several other different platforms uh, to make up that entirety of what it's become. So we talked about the Schwann's vehicles. Those are usually underpinned on an E450 chassis represented there by the bottom chassis that has a bus body on it in this picture. But everything on through from the F450-550, uh, the step van there that's uh, F53 or F59 typically used for delivery. And that's a booming business right now with all of the um, last mile delivery from companies like Amazon and all of those that are just having booms with the home delivery services, all the way through to refrigeration box trucks and dump trucks and city service vehicles. So, and you can see each one of these pins has a little bit of a different shade of color showing which market it serves. And you can see that food and beverage market that we talked about before being really expansive and uh, really just has exponential growth throughout the U.S. So why is propane such a good fit, uh, especially for the class three through seven? Well, Steve already talked about a few of these items, but if we look at all these different quadrants, we really see why it's just really a home run with fleets. So one is the US energy independence. So whether we're talking about uh, organic propane or we're talking about renewable propane, it's sourced here in the United States. So it's a great product for us as a country. It's also a great product for us in terms of being able to control what we have in terms of an emergency or anything like that. Duty cycle alignment is a big thing. So it's an alternative fuel that you don't have to modify your existing duty cycle to accommodate. And what I mean by that is range, operational conditions, temperatures, like I showed you uh, on the map, vehicles in all sorts of different climates and landscapes, and they're not compromising on how far they can go, how much weight they can carry, and all of those things that were mentioned earlier about what is the true characteristic of the vehicle. This is as close to a traditional fuel in the avenue of a duty cycle with all the benefits and some more of the environmental side of an alternative fuel. Financial is a really big piece of this puzzle too. So in terms of the cost savings, we have a lot of customers that get into it only because of what it can do for them on a cost per mile basis. I was with a good customer recently that went over their fuel logs after switching from diesel to propane and they reduced their overall fuel bill by 40%. So when a fleet looks at those top items and a lot of you on this call probably can resonate with this, fuel costs are in the top four or five typically of every fleet in terms of the cost that they're spending to keep that fleet running. So being able to reduce that cost per mile without subsidies and incentives is fantastic. But when we're talking about a near zero technology, you're applicable for all of those grants and subsidies and incentives. So could we add on to that? Absolutely. Do we need to with propane? No, it makes financial sense by itself, but there's opportunity to save even more or save even faster. Uh, moving on to that last one, which we're gonna focus on quite a bit today, which is the environmental side of it. Steve did a great job uh, layering in the renewable propane on top of it. And today we're gonna talk about the environmental side from a tailpipe uh, standard and what propane is doing to get us to near zero and what that looks like when you couple it with great new uh, products like renewable propane. So low NOx is one piece of this emission uh, tailpipe constituent that's really closely monitored and it was obviously a very big deal uh, with the Volkswagen scandal. So when we look at what California Air Resources Board has done, they've looked at NOx specifically as one of those eight tailpipe uh, uh, constituents and they've looked at it to say, this is one that's very toxic to human health, very bad for the environment, and we need to incentivize engine manufacturers like Roush and others to be able to certify to lower levels. And before that, there was no carve out. You couldn't look at uh, anything below the federal standard, which was 0.2. So what they said was, we're gonna create different carve outs. Obviously different engines will have different limitations of what they're able to do. And we'll create three different levels lower than federal. So 50% lower or the 0.1 level, 75% lower or 0.05, and then 90% lower or 0.02. 
So Roush took the initiative and we started this on our V10 platform. We've continued it on our 7.3 liter platform with Ford. And we offer as standard 0.05 or 75% lower than the federal standard. And then we also have an option to go down even lower to ultra low at 0.02 or 90% lower than the federal level. So both options are available throughout the entire lineup now, which is new for the 7.3 liter program that we're uh, in the process of launching right now. So now from your class three all the way up to your class seven, you're going to be able to get 0.05 the standard and an option to go down as low as 0.02. If we look at the tailpipe emissions as measured by uh, California Air Resource Board, EPA, these are the important constituents that they're going to look at um, as indicators for whether you meet the standards, whether you exceed the standards. So here's where we're at today with our new program. So this is our 7.3 liter V8. Uh, the base engine is a Ford gaseous prep ready to be run on propane with a propane uh, fuel system by Roush Cleantech. And we are the manufacturer of record on this engine. So this is our specific cert for propane on the 7.3 liter. If you look at everything right on down the line, you can see that we're at near zero levels on many of the constituents. Steve talked earlier about particulate matter. You can see 0 0.002, almost unable to register at that point when you look at the instrumentation. So ultra low, near zero, right on through NOx 0 0.021, well under the threshold there and achieving ultra low NOx status. The other big one that we mentioned that's being coming a more, uh, more prevalent focus is CO2. So uh, in the greenhouse gas family, and we've been able to make a big reduction going from our previous engine to our newest Gen 5. So we went from a level of 612 all the way down to 545 now on the 7.3 liter. So a really, really big improvement there um, coming down on the CO2 number. And we did that while simultaneously raising the actual horsepower of the engine by about 30 peak horsepower. So a big improvement there uh, from the CO2 standard. Now, when you start coupling that with what Steve mentioned, and we start looking at renewable propane coupled with the lower CO2 output of it, and you look at the life cycle of the vehicle, it just compounds the benefit and reduces the overall carbon intensity that much further. So really big strides being made with that coupling of renewable propane. Uh, one project that I wanna mention that's kind of forthcoming. So. Now uh, we talked about renewable propane, it's available today. You could go fill your vehicle up with it right now. Uh, Steve mentioned kind of an up and coming thing, which would be renewable DME. So we're actually in the process of doing some vehicle testing with renewable DME. Uh, it's gonna be an 80-20 blend. And that right now is going through engine dynamometer testing. So one of the big things that Roush does is, uh, is uh, major automotive testing. So we have one of the largest privately held dynamometer testing facilities right here in Livonia, Michigan. And we're right now in process of doing some of that testing. So we want to understand what does it do to tailpipe emissions? What does it do to the internals of the engine? Are there any benefits? Are there any side effects? And then once we get through this engine dynamometer phase, we're actually going to go to real world in vehicle testing when that's going to be a pilot that happens later this year uh, down in San Diego, actually. So going into our actual lineup of vehicles, just want to talk a little bit more about what we have available from Roush Cleantech. So our lineup, like I mentioned, is class three through seven, medium duty, many of the configurations that really are the underpinning of that entire lineup. The engine is purpose-built for propane by Ford Motor Company. So they offer a gaseous prep engine code. So the engine is ready to go for propane, no durability challenges for the life of the vehicle, absolutely robust to be run on propane for the life of the vehicle. Uh, you have OEM ordering options as well as ship through. So uh, we're part of the Ford ship through plan. So if you buy a chassis or you have a preferred chassis provider and a body upfitter, we can be part of that chain of moving that around, getting the vehicle upfitted at an OE level and moving on to your normal preferred bodybuilders. Uh, as well as you have your factory Ford warranty maintained. So once again, no uh, compromise when it comes to having an alternative fuel system on your vehicle. And that's a huge part of the whole operational experience, making sure that that base warranty is intact, the manufacturer is completely harmonious with the fuel system uh, right on through. To follow up with that, no loss of horsepower. So what that 7.3 liter produces on gasoline, we could actually make more potentially on propane, but we match exactly across the board. We mirror horsepower, torque, towing. Um, and then serviceability with existing diagnostics. So after you have the vehicle, obviously you wanna be able to work on it and your traditional Ford scan tool equipment or anything that you may use for a base Ford vehicle is gonna work right on through with the fuel system seamlessly. So a little bit more about the 7.3 liter V8. So this is a newer platform from Ford and also for Roush Cleantech. 
So we've departed from the 6.8 liter V10, which has been really a staple of the industry for the past oh, 15 years or plus. And what we're getting out of the 7.3 liter V8 is really a purpose-built medium duty engine from the ground up that Ford designed specifically with class three through seven in mind. So we picked up improved power, about 30 peak horsepower over the V10. We also departed from an overhead valve and um, uh, valve train technology down to a cam and block push rod technology. So the idea there is to simplify the medium duty engine. And in this application, we know the vehicles are pushed hard. They're run long time, a long time, a lot of hours during the day, operational hours, and a really hard life cycle overall. So the idea with Ford here was to simplify the design, make it extremely serviceable, and make it very robust for the medium duty life cycle. So the idea is that you don't touch this engine for the life of it, right? It's more service friendly when you do, but it's more robust in general in design. Uh, we've gone on to port injection. So really Ford has built this engine knowing that direct injection could be part of the future. And if we do go to direct injection technology on it, there's not an architecture change that needs to happen on the engine. So that coupled with several other things to make the engine more robust. Um, and we've really got a great medium duty uh, foundation here for our powertrain. To get a little bit more into the fuel system itself and the system integration, you can see here a cutaway view of an E-Series vehicle, and this has the Roush propane system in it. And what I want you to notice on this is that we go through a lot of effort and design to make sure that we very closely mirror the Ford factory OE fuel system, all the way down to line routing, tank placement, and other things to make sure uh, that we validate for a few things, because we know that there's a lot of different body applications out there. So whether we're talking about a very simple box truck that would go on the back of this vehicle, all the way through to a special needs equipped um, uh, bus body, all sorts of different applications. And what we know is that most of those applications, if not all, match up with the factory system that Ford offers on their fuel system. So if we mirror that very closely, we know that we can help validate with any body configuration that you may have interest in, which is really beneficial to give us that full breadth of what that vehicle may be used for, what that chassis may be used for. Getting a little bit further into uh, the tank itself and just showing you a view of top side and bottom side of what these tanks look like, you can see a few of the components here. So there's several safeties built in throughout these uh, fuel systems. Um, some are required, some are kind of above and beyond just because of the position Roush takes um, in terms of the overall design of the system. Uh, here we can see one of those uh, examples, so an overfill protection device. So we can make sure that when the, the vehicle is being filled, there's no guessing whether or not the tank is at 80% capacity or what we call full usable gallons. There's actually a device inside mechanically that's going to shut the tank off so it can't take any more fuel above what is allowed in the tank. You go uh, further into bleeder, the bleeder valve, which allows you to do some servicing and checking. The sending unit, which sends information up to your dash in terms of reading out what your fuel level is. And that's all integrated into your factory cluster. So it's not gonna be a separate gauge where you're reading. It's gonna be your normal gauge instrument cluster that's gonna tell you from full to empty and anywhere in between where you are with an accurate, consistent reading. Um, access port, so should you need to service anything in it, conveniently located so that you can take that off and everything that you need to access inside from a serviceability standpoint is right behind that service access port. So we try to design the entire system with serviceability in mind. The fuel supply valve, again, a very important feature, safety. There's actually three redundancies built into the safety of the supply solenoid itself. So uh, if you have any event, a crash, um, road debris, anything that could sever a potential fuel line or cause a cut in the system of anywhere. There's three redundancies built into that valve itself. So you have an electronic check, you have a mechanical check, and then you also have a shear point on the valve itself. So if there are impact to the tank and the whole valve were knocked off the vehicle, it would actually seal the tank from the inside out still. So a lot of safeties built in. We'll just go to the uh, the fuel return there, important piece, tank pressure to temperature sensor. It's all part of the calibration of the vehicle. How does the vehicle uh, behave in certain conditions? And that really gets into the, the Roush software side of it. So making sure that the vehicle behaves and operates in all those different conditions. We're actually constantly monitoring our tank pressure and temperature, and we're mirroring that to the engine. And we're actually making sure that the fuel pumps are consistently operating, regardless of what kind of ambient temperature that you're in or operating in. So getting into a little bit more on the specific application. So this would be an example of our class four and five. So F450, 550. Uh, this was previously the 6.8 liter. Now it's migrated over to the 7.3 liter. 
available in several different wheelbase and cab configurations. Um, our main uh, tank offering on this is a side saddle mount. You can see an example of that there. And we have both 35 um, variety and we also have a uh, 54 available on this application as well. So, and both are side saddle mounts. Uh, so several different configurations there and you can kind of see the overhead view of it. Moving on to 650, 750, so a little bit larger class of vehicle. Uh, we've got several different configurations for this one. It has, has a lot of availability for your shorter range and extended range um, offerings. So everything from a single um, saddle mount tank, and we can do either a large or a short version of that. And then we also have dual, which is shown there in the uh, cutaway picture. And we have a variety of either dual short tanks or we have a long and short combination that would give you a roughly 74 usable gallons aboard that vehicle. So for your higher range applications. And then we also do have some aft axles with one of our trusted partners in the industry that would be close to 65. So not as much as our dual saddle tanks, but if you have a configuration that limits that area or that space under the doors that you see there, we have other options that could potentially give you the right packaging. So once again, we try to make sure that we have those applications clear so that whatever body you need to accommodate, we'll be able to accommodate for you. And you can see some of the applications there, some of the interesting things that we've gotten into recently. Um, Asplen Tree Service, Steve mentioned, so a really good application there. Uh, beverage delivery you see at the top, and then actually a scissor body, which is used for uh, airport catering. And some of those are in service at LAX Airport. Going a little bit further into the 650, 750, so propane bobtail service, um, very popular application, great application, obviously, for a propane powered vehicle. Um, and then also one note there that, uh, which would be new for the spark ignited version of the Ford F650, 750, which would be air brakes. That's going to be a new application available for this platform uh, coming here in 2021. So a lot of people are looking forward to that. Um, and then uh, the F5359, so this would be your step van application. Uh, this would be your delivery, parcel delivery and that type of thing. Uh, once again, we have side saddle mount tanks available and then we also have an aft axle configuration available with several different capacities depending on your route needs. And then finally, the class um, three and four, so E350 and 450, very popular, um, high demand in the paratransit market shown there in the bottom left and then also uh, some food delivery and then parcel delivery also used for this vehicle. It's really been a true workhorse for the class three and four space for a long time. So several different offerings. We have a lot more um, that are available and we do have a program overview guide that kind of steps through all of those in more detail with even more information available on our website at roushcleantech.com. So um, with that, I just wanna wrap up by saying uh, when you get involved with Roush Clean Tech or a product, um, from us. Uh, we, don't, we don't sell it and then wish you the best of luck. We have a whole team here dedicated to making sure uh, that the customer has a positive experience. Everything from field tech support, so people actually remotely based, they're in the field able to address vehicles, to a technical support hotline that are based here in Livonia, Michigan with customer support agents, um, a full um, uh, uh, training catalog that's both web-based online and then we also do in-person training along with technical publications um, and actually our own uh, complementary diagnostic software that's available to our end users. So quite a bit to make sure that the operational experience is as good or better than what you expect out of traditional fuels. So with that, I will, uh, I will turn it back over to Mr. Taylor and uh, thank you very much. Do you, uh, on several occasions, you, you, you mentioned quite a bit about the availability of propane, but you didn't specifically say anything relative to what a person might expect to pay for a long-term contract kind of price. What, what kind of numbers would be normal for a fleet to look at if they're looking at long-term contracts that they get at the point where they sign up for a fleet for a, to, to service a fleet or to manage a fleet? Well, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, per, because of our organizational structure being set up by Congress, we, we can't get involved with pricing. Uh, but, I, but I can tell you um, what I have read in news releases and, and carry on that, that kind of conversation, if it's okay. Right, yeah, what you've observed. Yeah, what, what I have observed. Well, um, the, well for example, the, the, the Charlotte, North Carolina postal contractor that added eight trucks um, to, their, to their fleet, uh, they, they were able to do that and get their own infrastructure set up at, at their facility 
and had a three-year contract. Um, and it was you know, published at $1.39 uh, a gallon for three years. So she knew exactly what her price of fuel was going to be for the next three years. Um, you know, in, in her fleet, you know, they know exactly the distances between distribution centers. So it's a, it's a fixed route and they know exactly how much fuel they're going to go through. So her, her savings right out of the gate was, was 40% less than what it would have taken to do those same miles on, on diesel. But then she also had the, uh, the, the certainty of, of knowing what that fuel cost was going to be, um, which is a, I, I don't know many gasoline providers and, and diesel providers that, that, that do long-term contracts. <laughs> It, right. it, just, it just doesn't happen with their contracts. It's caught, it's a sort of a rack plus plus two or three cents, or maybe minus a cent or something like that. But it's it's based on the it's based on an index as opposed to a fixed number. Sure. Right. And and in her case, uh, she she had she had two things I, I'd, I'd like to mention. One is uh, she had her infrastructure costs rolled up into that that price per gallon. Uh, so she didn't have any out-of-pocket expense other than bringing a, uh, an electrical circuit out to where the, uh, uh, the refueling station was. Um, but then she also had a caveat to those propane marketers uh, who were, you know, vying for, you know, being able to provide her with that service and, and cost. Uh, she, uh, she, she's, she's what you call an all-in customer. Uh, Tim, she, she said, and don't bother bringing me any propane in a truck that's not running on propane. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I love, and, and everybody thinks I put her up to that, but I didn't. Uh, that was, that was all, all, all her. So. Well, there is that classic line, if you sell it, you drive it. And that's a good, that's a good way to prove that you really mean it for sure. So uh, I'll let you ask your question. I have several more. If nobody. If oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. This is your show. Jump in on us. Oh, well, you go ahead. You, you I, had, I had one for Ryan about the, the safety issue. Um, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with these tanks that are placed, you know, all, all, you know in various locations on there, um, you not only do the U.S. Uh, FMVS, you know, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard, because, you, you know, you have to do crash tests on these things, just like any other vehicle. But you guys, you guys also sell in Canada. So what, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, good question. So Canadian motor vehicle safety standards are a little bit more stringent than federal for here us in the U.S. So there's a little bit more that goes into what your testing is. Uh, basically, the they're more stringent on their time protocol. So they uh, in the U.S. they say, well, after impact, are there any leaks? And Canadian says, after impact, wait this amount of time and now check. Right? Let's let's see if anything fails under pressure or load. Um, so we certified at both FMVSS and CMVSS. And actually, in a lot of the medium duty, once you get over into a certain weight class, you're actually not required to do crash testing. But because of our partnership in the school bus world, we do crash testing. So even our class six and seven, which would be equivalent to the blue, large Bluebird Vision, or our class three and four, which would be equivalent to E35450, we do crash test. So uh, probably above and beyond what some of the other alternative fuels have to do because of our presence in school bus. And I noticed that your uh, your paratransit vehicle was had a stamp labeled Altoona testing, which uh, I, I guess is at least part of that crash testing, although I guess there's more to that than just that. And one of the questions I was going to ask is, uh, is the largest bus that you that you would be putting an engine in the Bluebird Type C, or do they have a Type D that is also propane? What's the biggest bus that you would be running on propane? The largest bus we have would be the Bluebird Vision, and that's a 33,000 gross vehicle weight rating. So that's up at kind of the top of the medium duty class, so about as large as they go. Uh, we do have a, a higher classification in the uh, F750 tractor, so we could get a gross combined of 50, so a little bit larger than what Bluebird does, but 33 is our highest vehicle. Um, so I, I, I was also, I, I was going to ask you about some mounted bodies. I, I, I thought it was sort of, but then your last slide had, uh, had, the, had that, uh, had the scissor lift and it had the, uh, the, the, uh, the bucket truck and whatnot, which so that kind of took care of that question. It looks like you can put not, I mean, any body that you can, that, that you need to be able to put on that frame rail because you get everything underneath the frame rails. 
um, the, the question I was going to, the, the question, you, you, you didn't really talk too much. I don't think maybe even brought up at all anything related to sort of the sustainability nature of a propane strategy. Maybe that's more of a Stephen thing than a, than a, than a, than a, uh, than a, a Roush thing. I'm not sure, but the idea of propane being available at, in, in a sort of a sustainability kind of a setting here in California, you know, it's not all that uncommon for the power to get shut off. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to address that because, you know, when, whenever there's a, uh, a you know, natural disaster uh, and you have first responders gathering um, for, for any length of time, when the tents get set up, you know, propane cooks their feud, propane heats the water that they take showers in, and, and propane powers the generators that provide the electrical you know, needs of, of all those first responders. So uh, the, the best part about the vehicle side is like when, when Ryan's school buses aren't being used during one of those natural disasters, uh, those school buses then get used to transport people in and out of, har out of harm's way. Um, <clears throat> and they're followed up with but, you know, propane bobtails that don't need uh, electricity to go and refuel their their fueling truck again. They can get it from bulk facilities uh, with with a pull as well as a, a push um, in in getting their, their their propane. So even totally absent from the grid, you know, propane can continue to provide you know fuel for vehicles as well as everything else in power generation for those natural uh, and and sometimes man-made disasters that we have to face. And you were you had an example, I think, of a school district where they're wet hosing the school buses overnight. Uh, I presume that's, in other words, you don't have to even have infrastructure in place to be able to keep a um, a vehicle or or genset system operational because you could just wet hose it from the bobtail. Is that sort of the way it works? You you can. It it's not real common because just like with diesel wet hosing, it's more expensive. Um, to have have that process, you know, you've got more labor, you've got, you know, mobile. I, I wasn't thinking on a regular basis. I was thinking in the sustainability context. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. You know, we can we can take those, you know, bobtail trucks in into any environment and, and be able to continue to provide that that energy source with or without power. Yep. So, uh, Edgar, I don't want to, I have two more, couple more questions, but I don't want to ask questions if we have anybody who's raised their hand um, on, the, on the line. Yeah, uh, no hand raising and also no written question yet. Okay. So well, I, I wanted, I, sorry, go ahead. I do have one question and this, this question is for Steve at Perk. It is, okay. So you, you talk about all these calculators. That was a joke. I was, you know, I follow flat on my face. But anyway, <clears throat> when, when, when we look at calculators to determine, uh, and, and, and no offense, Ryan, I know you've got some great total cost of ownership calculators to project how much savings there might be. We haven't seen forensic data. And so when I came on board with Perk, it was one of the very first things that I did. So I did a five-year analysis of, uh, uh, three different classes of vehicles. First one was was, uh, was an F550, which is a real common service truck in, in our industry for propane. So I took the same model year, 2016, I had two propane and two diesel, exact same chassis, exact same bodies, exact same location, performing the exact same work. Over five years of fuel that was going in them, and also maintenance of those. Okay, not the batteries, not the tires and everything else, but everything engine and fuel related was all added up thousands of, 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 of invoices for, uh, for, for all four trucks in, in that maintenance. And when you summed it all up over that five year period, the propane vehicles operated at 24 cents a mile for maintenance and fuel. And the diesel was 53 cents a mile for maintenance and fuel. And that was over the five year period. Okay. And that included everything from fuel pumps to diesel exhaust, you know, filters being, I mean, it, it included everything. And it was less than half the cost of operating on diesel. Yeah, very impressive. Um, I'll ask, uh, we're getting pretty close to the noon hour, but I, I was, maybe I'll ask just one quick one. Um, would you give a, a little bit more information on the, uh, 
uh, the DME pilot project. I heard you, you mentioned that something was going to happen. And maybe it was Ryan said something was going to happen Q1 of 2021, I think it was. Um, what are the odds we're actually going to see something uh, in the commercial world? Any, I mean, what's the time frame for, uh, you know, Steve had that beautiful example of, uh, of a blended, a renewable DME with renewable propane in a blended setting having basically a carbon intensity of basically one, I think it looks like. Uh, um, when is the time frame that somebody might say, I could actually be operating my fleet at a carbon intensity of one? Well, right now, you know, REG is, is, is coming right out of the gate. And we're, you know, if, if you're comparing it to the electric grid, it's 131 tons less than the electric grid in California today. That's, that's pretty darn good. Okay. And you can get that right there in Sacramento. Um, so, but if we were to take the, you know, the DME, which is coming online right around the first of the year, and because of what Roush is doing that, that Ryan explained with their testing, we're validating all of this on, on dynamometers. Okay. We've been, you know, we've been testing it for quite some time, but now we're validating it through, through Roush. And then Ryan, you were talking about an actual fleet in, yeah. uh, uh, that, that's going to be operating it. So not just in the lab with the dynamometer, but you're going to be putting it into a fleet that has several hundred vehicles, correct? Yeah, and we would do a small cross sample of those vehicles. So five or six is what the target is. So we get those going post dynamometer testing, make sure that everything looks good before we actually um, implement into a customer fleet. And then we're gonna let them do their normal job that they do every day with all the rest of their vehicles to prove out that there's absolutely no operational consideration for it. You know, that we're is not- that that's going to be the 7.3 on a 0.02 gram cert? Well, no, because these are existing vehicles in their fleet. So they're not brand new vehicles. We're actually going to apply this into their existing vehicles. Now, we are doing engine dynamometer testing, though, with a new engine. Yes. Well, I uh, we're right at the noon hour, and... Um, I'm pretty much out of questions and I think we're all set. You guys did a phenomenal job. We really appreciate it. What a great set of information for us to work with. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna jump back in and get my screen back on for just a second here um, to say, see if we can make it look professional here and get the full, there we go. Um, once again, thank you to the Clean Cities uh, sponsors that make it possible for our coalition to be able to function. And to remind folks that, um, that today's presentation will be um, posted up on our Clean Cities website. And um, we have, then November 11th, we have our grant writing and, and, fund, and finding grant funds uh, seminar webinar. And on December 9th, we have our heavy duty battery electric drivetrain webinar. And then, um, once again, thank you very much to our two presenters, Stephen Whaley from, uh, from Perk and Ryan Zick from uh, Roush. We really appreciate it for both of you, and we will be signing off right now. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.